Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 25. The purpose of this podcast is to take high level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. We have our three hosts today, Sebastian, Rick, and myself, and we do have some special guests who Rick will be announcing very shortly. I wanna preface this by saying thank you for all of the support. Episode 24 was all about Africa. If you wanna check that out, we had John on there, we had Charles, we had Lars, Paulina, Tamara, Kwame, Florian, it was a jam-packed episode. If you are watching this episode right now and you haven't subscribed to The Cardano Effect, please consider subscribing. Please like and comment on this video. We really appreciate the feedback. And for all the people that wanted a shorter version of the podcast, we're going to keep our long format, but you can go ahead and subscribe to The Cardano Clips. It's a truncated version of The Cardano Effect. What we do is we stitch our episodes together and we take little clips and put it on the Cardano Clips channel. And that allows users that don't have as much time to go and watch five, 10 minute clips of what's going on within the episode. They're well titled, they're well labeled. So if you need, if you are not a fan of the long version form of the podcast, there's a channel for you, the Cardano Clips. I'm gonna link it below. I also wanted to say that Cardano 1.5 has been released. So if you are, if you have data lists on your computer, you wanna go ahead and update your data list. Yodoi automatically updated, so you don't have to worry about that. But data list, you need to update. And I, I wanna stress this because I was on Ada Scan the other day or the other week, and one of the largest wallet addresses is actually Binance. And we're in cryptocurrency, we're all about having this sovereignty over our funds. So people that are long-term hodlers of ADA or you, you are within the Cardano ecosystem, you wanna take control of your own funds and you wanna participate within this protocol, you need to move your funds off the exchange to, a, to an appropriate wallet. And that could be Daedalus or that could be Yodoi. So you wanna make sure that you're getting familiar with that because that's how you're gonna be able to participate within this protocol. When staking comes out, that's how you're gonna be able to participate. When voting comes out, all the features are going to be outside the exchange. You don't want to hold your, hold your ADA within an exchange and not be able to participate within this protocol. That being said, none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. Remember that you are your best financial advisor. And if you don't believe you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. So with that being said, without further ado, Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? Philippe, I'm doing great, thanks. And also, thank you for getting the word out. You can't stake from Binance. I do want to make sure the viewers know this podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and SoundCloud. We also have a Reddit channel. The Cardano Effect on Reddit. So if you guys want to leave us some inputs, questions, ideas for new subjects, or start a thread of your own, feel free to go over to that subreddit and let us know what you think. Uh, so I want to get on to our, our guests today. We have Philip Kant and Jared Kodawan of IOHK. Philip Kant obtained his PhD in theoretical physics from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. He spent six years as a researcher studying the Higgs boson and top quarks developing algorithms or calculations in perturbative quantum field theory. And uh, Dr. Jared Kodawan, he goes by Jared, and Jared Kodawan is a mathematician with interests in logic and computer science. He holds a PhD in mathematical logic from Dartmouth College, where he studied reverse mathematics, computability theory, Infinitary cart combinatorics. I had trouble just pronouncing the word. <laughs> he has a doctor's degree in it. And and forcing. He is fascinated by the incompleteness phenomenon. So amazing uh, backgrounds there. And let's start with Philip Kant. So Philip, how are you doing today? And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do for IOHK. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Philip. I started off my career as a physicist. And as you said, I spent quite some years as a postdoc. And while I did that, you need to do some calculate, some some uh, programming of your own because there's no off-the-shelf software for these kind of calculations that you have to do. And so I picked the Pascal and um, I found that I really, really liked it and read some of the papers about some, um, some individual features of the language as well. And then at some point decided that that's what I wanted to do professionally and made the switch to software development. And yeah, now I ended up at IHK and um, 
two years ago, somewhat over two years ago, um, we decided to start a formal methods group in the company to um, basically make sure that nothing gets lost in translation between research and development and to transfer all those proofs of security that we have on the on the side of the research that those also um, end up in get, getting transferred into the actual implementations and so that's that's what i do here all right thank you philip and jared how about yourself what do you do for ohk a little bit of your background as well yeah so uh yeah i'm on the formal methods team um i started uh Originally, when I went to grad school uh, for mathematics, I just thought I wanted to teach math, um, and that was my plan. But at some point, I decided that uh, software engineering sounded really exciting. So I th I thought I made a complete 180 switching to software. Um, I had a job uh, you know, doing C++ and Python for quite some years. I, and at, then at some point, I guess because of blockchain, I sort of uh, became aware of functional programming and realized that all this, uh, all this cool math that I really loved was still there in programming. Uh, <laughs> So I um, so I got very interested in um, formal methods because uh, I thought maybe it was a way to have my cake and eat it too, get to uh, enjoy some of the parts I loved about math, but also some of the parts I loved about programming. Um, so now I get to do that at IOHK. Great, that's good to hear. And so both of you have mentioned uh, formal methods. And so one thing I want to touch on at the beginning is in, in basically in simple terms, um, what is formal methods and what does that mean? Because a lot of times people get the impression, including myself, that formal methods kind of gives me the feeling that that means the software is going to be perfect every time it's rolled out the door. But uh, that's not really a good description of formal methods, is it? What, what's your take? What is formal methods? Well, um, I, I guess one way to describe it is that when you, when, you're, when you are programming, then ultimately you're doing mathematics and teaching something mathematical to the computer. But a lot of time, if you, if you look at your code, then you don't really realize that that's what you're doing. It doesn't, doesn't look anything like mathematics in a, in a paper. And formal methods are one way to basically bring, it, bring, bring that back and, and get your programs in a, in a form where you can reason about them like you can reason about mathematics in a paper and where you can prove certain properties of it, and also have those proofs be checked by the computer sometimes, or ideally, although that's um, that's quite involved. So what we do at IOHK sometimes is something that's called lightweight formal methods, which is going into the direction of that and, um, and basically making your code easier to reason about and getting somewhere in the direction, sometimes using computer-aided proofs, sometimes doing proofs by hand, but basically getting getting it getting it closer to 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 mathematics. So that's that's one one take. Jared, do you want to add on to that? Oh yeah, that's a good description. There's certainly a, a lot of things that fall under that umbrella of formal methods. And at one extreme is um, what you said <clears throat> about uh, you know the, it does exactly what uh, what you said it does. Of course, that can fall apart at the edges where you know you may make assumptions, um, uh, but th th that is one extreme of formal methods. Uh, the other extreme, uh, just explicitly stating um, what it is you expect the program to do is already a huge step in the right direction. Just having a specification or uh, stating in some sort of unvague uh, terms um, what your system does. So what would you tell a beginning software engineer? So let's say someone just graduated um, with their software engineering degree and they want to get into formal methods. What would you tell them is the most interesting thing about formal methods? I think there is um, among some programmers a lot of fascination with mathematics, especially in the functional programming world where people do get excited about seeing um, some of the words that they saw in math classes appear in programming classes. And that doesn't always happen. Um, and so to some people, that's really exciting. So I think showing them where the overlap between math and computer science for some people can be a huge draw and can be really exciting. Um, and then the other thing on the other side, uh, if you don't care about that at all, um, it may be that after you've been programming for a while, you see the same sorts of errors happen over and over again. And um, it might be that some of the simple things that you can do to check some of these things, um, it would be appealing to them to, to stop shooting themselves in the foot on uh, mistakes that are easy to make um, with, that you can uh, attempt to avoid. How does formal methods make 
Cardano a better cryptocurrency? Well, ultimately, it's it's about assurance, right? Because if you if you want to have this working, if you want to have this be a viable infrastructure, if people trust their money in there, then you want to make sure that it's that it's not misbehaving, that it does what it's supposed to do, like in other high assurance areas like um, <clears throat> aviation or finance generally, or also uh, medical software. You want to make sure that the things are actually implemented correctly, and um, for that, we are doing multiple things at IOHK. We are working together with the researchers who actually look at those those complicated uh, proof of stake um, systems and they devise protocols that are that are secure as long as you have a, an honest majority, and that also deliver proofs of this security. And then we we work with formal methods, so we basically transfer the contents of the research paper, which is prose English and some mathematical formulae and a lot of um, still ambiguity which is there and which 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 also can be there in the paper because it's it's meant to be read by colleagues who, who know these things but then we we transfer those into into specifications semi-formal or formal which really pin down all these ambiguities and are then um, consumable by both by the researchers so that they can check that this is actually what they meant and also to the programmers so that they can go from there and implement it and also check it back against the specification via automated testing. So basically what you were saying, if I'm not mistaken, if I could use an analogy, let's get, let's say a, um, a manual for a, a vehicle and it shows all the different parts that constitute the vehicle. There's tens of thousands of parts. Mm -hmm. You're writing that manual. So everyone could build the car or the mechanic can fix the car, the, the manufacturer can actually build the car, the entire supply chain can work. Is that a good grasp or is, is that a good analogy of what's going on? I like it. And in fact, too, you could um, you could imagine that uh, some electrical engineers would write uh, diagrams for some of the circuitry going on in the car and that you had uh, different sorts of engineers working on other parts of the car and they may be speaking slightly different languages. Um, you know, they have their own way of communicating about things because they're different sort of um, uh, subfields within the same field and getting um, putting together a manual that everyone could understand um, might be something valuable. And that's, that's I feel like that's kind of part of the piece that Philip was mentioning where some of the um, uh, papers in, with uh, cryptography um, are written for an audience of cryptographers. Um, and so they may, uh, one of the papers that was uh, in the Ouroboros paper, there of course they have to be explicit about, uh, you know, their model that they're working in. So there'll be steps in their algorithm will be, well, they'll say like, you know, and now send this bit of information to the adversary. Now programmers not, going to send that information to the adversary at that step. You know, it, they're OK if that adversary sees that information, but that's not a step they have to worry about. So there's there's some um, uh, some nice things that come from just formalizing what it does for everybody to understand. People in the Cardano ecosystem have heard a lot about formal specifications, formal methods, formal verification. Uh, and I like you to kind of spend some time explaining the difference between these three things, if you can, to give people an idea of where you lie within that, that greater sphere. I mean, formal methods is basically, it's, it's an umbrella term for, for a lot of things that, that basically allow you to, to formally reason about your programs and to prove things about them and to, to make sure that certain errors don't happen. Now, formal specifications, they're, they're basically the first step that you have to do if you want to do anything formal with the program itself, because if you don't have a specification that says, um, this is what the program is supposed to be doing, then it's very hard to, to basically to, yeah, to, to show that the program does what it's supposed to do because you don't have, a, you don't have laid it out formally. So um, what we do there is that we um, basically have, have a, uh, yeah, a specification that tells us what the program should do, and it does that in an unambiguous way. So um, Jared spent a lot of time writing those, and so maybe he can he can explain a bit about how those how those look and what they what, what they say. So uh, when you're writing a formal specification, there's there's even more than one ways you could go about doing it. Even even there, 
there's a lot of options. So one thing you could do is you could pretend that you're um, the program that you want to write is a mathematical function, and you could try to state what that mathematical function is uh, in, without using a programming language. Um, that might be one way to, to do it. Uh, another way you could do it is you could say, here's the state of my program, and here, here are all the different um, operations you can use to change state from piece to piece. Here's operationally what you do um, at every step, unambiguously, if you're in this situation and you see this, do this. Um, so yeah, so we've written uh, the most recent uh, formal specifications in the second style, this sort of operational style. Um, yeah, so, and I could explain more about um, what, what exactly they look like, but essentially they're state transformation. So they say, if this is the state of the world and you see this, you can, this is the new state of the world. Um, and that should make some sense uh, in terms of uh, blockchains and ledgers, because you have, you know, who owns what, uh, what ADA, and then there's a transaction. Is that transaction valid? If it is, then this can be the new state of the world. Um, so we explicitly state um, how you make those transitions without using a programming language. So are there, are there like go-to mathematical models that you use to determine the robustness of the blockchain that you're working on? Is it, um, like you said, this is, seems like it's a custom built, um, it's a custom built package for each project that you're working on, but are there certain, uh, is there a certain, uh, I would say like a certain theory or a certain mathematical model that you go to every time? There doesn't have to be. For us, we've chosen something really simple and straightforward. So it's uh, it's basic set theory. I mean, set theory itself can be quite complicated, but we've carved out a little small piece of basic set theory. So this just means that you can have functions and maps, and you can you have sets, and you can add to sets, you can remove from sets. Um, so we've just taken basic set theory as our language, um, and then there's there's no real logical framework to it because it's it's quite simple. And the, the logic about the robustness of the blockchain, that's then something that, that is handled on, on those research papers that, that basically live on a whole other level of abstraction. So they have this adversarial model where they say, okay, unless the adversary controls more than, the, more than half the stake, then th they have the proofs that, that the system is secure. And, and they also, in the, in the newer versions of Ouroboros, they also factor in things like if there's delays in the network that can even be controlled by the adversary, then as long as they are bound by something, then we have security. So, and so, so this is where you actually talk about the, the blockchain system and its security. And then the stuff that, that we do is then basically, how do we make sure that the ideas that the cryptographers have about uh, designing this blockchain system, that they are captured unambiguously and end up in the program, and also that they are not in conflict with with reality. If they because they they live at a high level of abstraction and they they make some assumptions about the real world and about how computer systems in the real world work, and um, since. Uh, computer systems are not their day-to-day -day job. They they might have assumptions that are more or less realistic. So we have a we have a feedback loop there so th that we tell them, okay, if if you want to send messages across the across globally across the network, then you have to allow for yeah for for some for this or that time and distribution and and stuff. And so so we basically make sure that that. Um, while we are taking their ideas and transforming them into those formal specifications, that we also give them some feedback about things that um, that will probably work, or things where they probably have to get back and and incorporate some some constraints from from how systems work and when you when you have computers. You know, you you just gave a really good real world example. Like for example, you came up with a twenty seconds per slot. I don't know, is that like a formal specification by saying, okay, we have 20 seconds per slot. Is that a formal spec? Just as yeah, an example? I mean, yeah, I mean, the, that, the specification. Yeah, they, they, they okay. talk about the slots and the slot length. And then, um, yeah, typically we, we keep it variable in the specification because we only want to commit to one slot length at the very end of having implemented everything. So okay. Yeah, but um, yeah, that, that's something that is that is mentioned in the specs. And then, and then, we have people looking at or, and simulating um, a system and looking at is it is it realistic that we get things across the network in the slot length and um, stuff like that.
Okay, and I'm assuming it takes many iterations to actually write a formal specification. Like nobody ever writes it right the first time. You come up with a general idea, then you test it and practice it and you rewrite it again. I'm assuming it goes through that process. And just like the 20 second slot example, like did you actually test in the real world? Because you want it to work in the real world. How long does it take packets to traverse planet Earth? And then go back to specification and say, all right, how do we modify that? Is that generally how it works? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, before we launched the first version of the of the of the Cardano network, the initial version that's that's currently running, the Byron network, um, we did extensive testing because, um, yeah, if if things don't work with with that slot length and blocks take too long, then then you get forks and stuff. So, and and so we 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 do have uh, people who basically measured the internet and how long it takes to to send messages across and individual um, pieces of information. But that's only a half half of the story. If you if you talk about the blockchain system, then what what you also have to take into consideration is that when a node gets a message, gets a new block, then it could of course forward it to every one of its peers immediately. But that that wouldn't be optimal because then you would open up yourself to denial of service attacks if you you could just flood the network with invalid blocks. So every node has to, before it sends the information on, it has to make some kind of checking and, and check whether that block is maybe not if it's perfectly valid, but at least whether it's whether it's uh, likely to be valid so that you filter out garbage early on. And that takes time as well. And so you have to strike this balance between um, filtering out garbage aggressively and possibly losing a few seconds more and filtering out nothing at all and opening up yourself to denial of service attacks that flood the network with garbage. And um, so we spent quite some time doing, doing extensive benchmarks of the system before we launched in order to be confident that what we, what we would launch would actually um, yeah, not, not fall over its own feet and also um, would properly be guarded against people trying to send garbage across the network and stuff like that. And so um, the first time around, we did that without without a formal specification. So we um, we more or less directly translated the research papers in into code, um, but that that worked as well. Now we're doing it via the um, via this more formal approach, where we basically do a do a step by step thing and um, do it in an in an even more robust manner. Um, but sure, we'll we'll have to um, we we do iterations. We already do iterations on on the design, which is one step before the formal specifications, and and then yeah, on, on the formal specifications as well. We have we have um, chats within the group where we where we go over new paragraphs and 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 new subsystems that are included in the specs and and talk about them, think about them, go over them once again. That's that's just how it how it works. Thanks, thanks for that explanation. And you know, so it's kind of interesting. It kind of goes from uh, research and design to formal specifications to engineering level. And we have both of you on here. You're you're researchers and you have PhDs. Sebastian is an engineer. What would be a real simple way of explaining how does it go from being research to Sebastian writing code? Mm -hmm. What's the quick steps there? Yeah, I, mean, I can help answer that because that's actually already kind of what we're doing with Yodoi, right? So uh, both Philip and Jared work on Shelly, right? And for Yodoi, we want to enable staking from Yodoi. So to do that, it means we have to read their formal specification, figure out exactly how it works and how we can implement that into our system. So if you look actually at a GitHub repository, I can pull up the name. It's called Cardano Ledger Specs. So if you go on github.com and you search up Cardano Ledger Specs, you'll find a GitHub repository with the formal specification of how Shelly will work, along with the delegation design document that talks about the design decisions. And if you read through that document and then you look at the issues tab, you can find questions that we've asked the research team or the formal methods team at IOHK. And so we read the document ourselves, and we probably understand, you know, 95% of it uh, just by reading the math. And that's the beauty of it, right? As long as you can understand the math, you don't have to ask questions. You can know exactly how it's going to work. Uh, but obviously, uh, everybody's human. We, there's a 5% component where you're, you're looking and you're like, I, I don't understand. 
And so we do ask questions about it. And so you can you can see on GitHub us asking questions and us getting answers. And as we get answers, we take that uh, and turn that into code on our side to eventually enable staking within Yodoi. And of that 5%, sometimes the uh, confusion is not Sebastian's, but uh, one, one of us, maybe me, <laughs> having written something incorrect. I, I did want to mention a little bit about the iteration too, because that's one of the fun parts for me. Um, you know, I've, I've, uh, we are also at the same time as we're writing this um, PDF document, this formal sophistication, we're, we're also writing a, a Haskell program which mimics the spec um, and it, but it takes a lot of simplifying assumptions. So it doesn't use a real database. It doesn't, you know, it does a lot of, it doesn't have a real network connection. It's a simplified version of it, but it, it fits the same rules. It follows the exact same rules. Um, and this has been immensely helpful because I've worked on, I've, I've added to both. So sometimes I'll write, um, I'll write in the, I'll write something for the PDF and then I'll go to code it up in the Haskell model. And I'll realize that what I wrote was wrong. So then I'll go back to the LaTeX, or sorry, the PDF. That's what we're using to generate it. Um, and they, the, the two things actually inform each other pretty well. It's really fun. And then sometimes uh, some of the uh, software engineers will read the executable model and see something that's wrong there. So there's, there's dialogue back and forth between all these pieces. Um, and it's really fun when the people at uh, Amergo will ask questions that I won't uh, off the top of my head really know the answer to. Like um, I think Ruslan asked, uh, what if the um, pool, what if there are no pool operators? What if they set the, to the empty set there? And I'm thinking, well, I think I know the answer, but you can go through the spec line by line. And, and Ruslan knows how to check it. He did a great job, but he was just you know, getting a sanity check. Um, and I go through it and I said, well, here's what happens. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of nice um, to be able to have that as a point of truth that we can all iterate on. It's giving everyone a, a common language. So when, when Sebastian says that as long as you understand the math, it's, it's really not complicated math. It's basically right. just, just set theory and function. So that's something that you really, you, you, have, you basically spend, spend an afternoon learning how, how to read those specs and then, then you can do it. And then everybody can talk about them and there is no ambiguity left. And you can ask very pointed questions. You can, for instance, when, when, when you write those specs, uh, questions come, that, that you, you just naturally think about questions like, should we allow UTXO entries that have zero value in them, where, where it's just an output of, of zero, and, and is that a good thing or not? And those questions just come up when, when you read those, because you have to state this, um, yeah, it's, it's a value greater than zero or greater or equal than zero. And then you talk about them and you realize, oh yeah, maybe, maybe it does make sense to have zero value UTXO entries. And yeah, it's it's a great way to to iterate over this because it's it's something that the researchers understand, we understand, the developers uh, understand, um, and yeah, so that's that's a very good thing to iterate over the the design. So if you think about IOSK, they actually have two clients, right? They have the Rust client and the Haskell client. So that means when they write the specification, it has to be abstracted one level above. Okay, so they write it in mathematics. But then the Haskell team has to come up with an implementation that matches the Haskell team. And then we, as Yoroi, have to come up with an implementation that also matches what the Haskell team is doing and what the Rust team is doing. And so if you look at the, again, at the GitHub uh, project, you will see kind of more engineering focused specs where it, it goes down to the binary on the computer. How do you represent this specific data structure in binary because we have to make sure everybody agrees on the exact representation of what is a number, what is a string, what is a certificate, what is a pool, all this kind of information. And it's something we're actually thinking about because even though uh, the clients themselves, both the Haskell team and the REST team are, are working on the implementation, for us as Yodoi, we have to also be building at the same time to meet the deadlines, mm -hmm. right? So that means that we have to start building the system on mock data, which is like fake data that we generate ourselves by hand to test our system. So that means that we also have to go through the spec and look at the proposal of how to represent this in binary information and think, okay, how can we put this into our mock data? We have to make sure everything matches every step so that all the code uh, goes smoothly. And so it's a very complex uh, project <laughs> with a lot of teams trying to work at the same time and coming to an agreement. Uh, so it's an extremely hard engineering challenge and it's been going uh, fairly well so far, I think. All the teams have been fairly happy with the process 
and it's moving at a very fast pace uh, given the difficulty of the problem. So that's kind of another aspect to it. Thank you, Sebastian. So what you guys have done is you've walked us from research all the way to the writing of the code. So the next step becomes testnet. Um, that gets us from the, so do you guys deploy under the testnet and say, all right, now that it's actually running in a, a close to real world environment as we get, is it actually doing what the specifications in the research said it was doing? How does that work? <clears throat> I mean, the, once once we are on a test net, we we basically have have we are past the point where we have to check that it's that it's agreeing with the with the research papers because that's that's part of the the main development process. So there we we have the basically the the verification steps on every level that we talk with the researchers, give them the specifications, make sure that there is no gap there. And then we also have, for Jared mentioned, the the formal, the, the executable specifications, which is basically the translation, which is really it's it's basically verbatim translation of the things in the formal spec to Haskell code, which can then execute, but it's is not is not efficient, doesn't have doesn't have a database and stuff like that. But you can then write write tests tests against that for the actual production code. So in that way, you have this this chain of basically evidence that what, what you have in the code is really what what is in the paper and then with the test net of course you then you are more on the empirical side where you look at what happens when we actually deploy these things and and you are in the real world where you have where you have a distributed cluster of of computers and and they send messages back and forth. You have actual users that that interact with the system and and send things, and so that's basically that's um, yeah that that's more like you you're off the design board, you're out of the factory, and now you're basically you're looking at at how well the the car behaves on on a street where you where you still have some some more security than on on a public street. It's like a like a private street. Um, but you, you actually drive the thing and see how well it performs. So you just described this, this entire process, this entire flow chart. Um, I was researching about formal methods over the weekend and I, and I ran about this word called axiomatic semantics, basically describing the state of something before and after. So if we apply it to something like Shelley, are there certain, it's saying that formal methods can basically describe the situation before and then once it actually deploys it after but in between are there certain variables where formal methods fall short or cannot predict and do you how do you how do you how do you deal with these kind of things what are the drawbacks where where are their holes i would say oftentimes the assumptions are what bite you usually the oftentimes you can make a consistent model and it does what you expect and you check it and maybe you check it rigorously with proofs, but you find out your assumption was rubbish. Um, a lot of times I feel like that's where these things break. They break at the edges. Um, I try to remember some examples that happened in the, uh, in the news recently where they'll say such and such a thing was formally verified, but you know, you hear it broke and it's, it's always at the boundaries. Um, so yeah, beware the axioms. And that's why, why we also work with, with people who have, so we have a, um, a consultancy, predictable network solutions. They, they have lots of experience with, with distributed networks and, and their performance characteristics and, and the different ways in which they can break down. And so um, they basically, they, they look over our shoulder all the time when we're designing these things. And, and sometimes they come up and say, ah, this is, this is, this will go wrong or if, if you don't change anything. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically where so, you need to have experience and and um, yeah some some data in order to know which kind of kinds of assumptions are good and and which ones will will bite you. Right. I can give you a kind of a I think this is a fun example. We'll see. Um, so recently, I, I wanted to introduce um, a cycle for these uh, key evolving signatures and a cycle we wanted to be a day. So I defined <laughs> a term called a day, and then someone mentioned, oh well, is day well defined? I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, day's a little tricky. So then I thought, well, we'll define it in terms of slots. That makes sense. And then I got to thinking, well, how well defined are our slots? Are they dependent on atomic seconds? Or if the scientists decide one year that um, there's gonna be a leap second, is that something we have to worry about? Maybe it's not, maybe it is. Um, so that would be one thing where in the model, it might look very consistent. Here's a day is this many slots, blah, blah, blah. And then 
when it comes to actually running the code, you realize slots weren't tied to atomic seconds the way you thought they were. And the thing can uh, potentially, maybe, who knows, have a problem. That's fascinating, fascinating, because <laughs> Cardano is supposed to be future-proof, and right. you have to make sure that you, this, these, these, this method lasts for a decade plus, you know, it could be Cardano could exist 50 years from now. So right. you have to make sure that all the variables are accounted for. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. And I, I, I like my lead second before. Really? <laughs> yeah, we had, we had Y2K problems in Cardano. It's possible. We don't want to see any Y3K problems. I'm sure it'll be around. <laughs> right. I would like to add, or I would like to flip the question and say that, you know, uh, there are a lot of trolls in the cryptocurrency community, and they like to um, rag on Cardano for being peer reviewed and using formal methods. What can go wrong if a cryptocurrency or a blockchain doesn't use formal methods? How bad can it be? And give us a worst case scenario, some of the problems you've encountered and how they apply to maybe other blockchain projects that are not using formal methods. Well, I mean, the worst thing that, I mean, that there's multiple bad things that, that you can imagine that can happen if the software doesn't work correctly. I mean, the, the chain could stop progressing. You could you could get get arbitrary long forks. You can get, the, the system can be easily subverted because your assumptions about the security or because, yeah, because you, you thought you were secure, your protocol was good, but it wasn't. So that's, that's um, yeah, I mean, if, if you, if, if you, don't put rigor into designing those things and make sure that the design ends up in the implementation, then if you can get things breaking at the chain level. I mean, there's also, if you, if you go one step further and you look at smart contract systems, then there's countless examples of where, th where people thought they had written the contract in a, in a good way, but then in the end it was exploitable and people lost money. So, um, I mean, yeah, things that can go wrong is basically you you lose all your money that's <laughs> that's that i think that's yeah. that's yeah, the yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's kind of like asking if you have someone come to do some work on your house to fix your plumbing or your electrical work how good a job do you want them to do how how well do you want them to understand what they're working on and it is a balancing act you don't want them to spend five years and spend tons and tons of money to fix a simple leak mm -hmm. um, but if it's a very important piece of your house you know maybe they should spend more time understanding it. so it's a balancing act it's just really asking how well do you want to understand what it is you're making and doing yeah thanks for that i love those real world examples um and and just uh another example is there's a, an author out there who wrote an article about something called fake stake or a fake stake attack. And uh, Sebastian had uh, some information that he put out on that. And there was a blog on the fake stake. Now, Philip actually wrote the IOHK rebuttal, which is available on the IOHK website on the Car uh, Cardano is secure against fake stake attacks. That's the paper you can look up on the IOHK website. Do you guys want to tell us a little background? What is a fake stake attack? And what was your reply to why Cardano is not subject to that? Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I remember this correctly. So um, the fake stake attack, that was basically um, an, an attack that was kind of universal for a large number of proof of stake um, systems. But it was so because they were all basically descendant from, from one code base that introduced proof of stake in a kind of yeah in a kind of way to, to bake it into a, a code base that was originally designed for proof of work. So I think unless I'm mistaken, it it made it made it easier for you to find the correct hash for the proof of work problem. If you had, if if you proved that you had some stake in in the same, in the same, uh, in, yeah, in, in this within the same block header, and then it was kind of there. There were ways in which you could um, basically subvert this this proof that you had some stake, and then you got to you got an easier hash accepted, but you you didn't really have that stake, and that was that was. Um, also related, so there were different um, 
basically different variants of the idea text. Some relied on the header and the block body being being submitted separately, and then the software only checking something based on the head. And then it couldn't really look at at this um, at this um, at at the transaction that that you had to make for this for this kind of um, uh, that that proved that you had this this stake. And so so those basically the, the bottom line is that these fake stake attacks they were all yeah they were all based on this kind of way of introducing proof of stake into a system that was originally proof of work by just making the hash easier if you if you provided some some stake and then you could basically yeah fake the stake and say that you had it but you didn't really have it and the nodes in the system wouldn't bother to do the full check because that full check was very difficult for them to do um, in the Ouroboros uh, protocol, you don't have that problem. You have um, basically you have uh, well-defined points in time at which you look at the overall stake distribution, and it is not a problem. Or it is the, the nodes are designed in such a way that they can really that, that they really have this stake distribution at their disposal every time they check a block header, and so um, you basically can't fool those nodes and and. Yeah, again, it's it's kind of it's this is yeah, this is a benefit of really doing uh, things from scratch and not not basically taking a, a code, a code base that is there and that has proof of work and then trying to fiddle around with it a bit until you have proof of stake in there, but just upfront doing a design of a proof of stake system and thinking about okay how do I, how can i manage to have this uh, the stake distribution um fixed at a time before i have the randomness and all these all these subtleties and then designing a protocol and proving that it's secure and implementing it and um yeah then then you don't get this particular problem another example in the real world was this another blockchain called eos and when they released their blockchain within one week of the release, the blockchain froze for everybody. And they had to do like an emergency repair and send this new version to everybody out there. Right, so it's, it, it highlights the importance of doing the verification work before you release, right? And that's what we're doing for Shelly. We're not saying, okay, well release Shelly and over time think about it and do the proofs. It's like, no, you gotta do the proofs first because it could break right after you, you ship. And that's what happened in the case of EOS. So. Obviously, these cases occur throughout the crypto ecosystem because a lot of people don't do this work. But I think also uh, one of the things people think about when they think of formal verification and, and bugs in the crypto ecosystem is on the smart contract layer, right? So people often think about bugs in Ethereum that have cost a lot of money, most of which were not in the base protocol, but were within these smart contracts. Now, I was case trying to solve this problem with projects such as Plutus, KVM, and Yella. So how does the work that your teams are doing compare to the work that, for example, the Plutus team is doing? Is it the same kind of work? Do you use different tools, different methods? How does it compare? Yeah, I mean, the, the language teams, they are designing new languages for writing smart contracts up front. And with a with a goal of having those languages be designed in such a way that it is hard to make mistakes or that it that it is easy to write correct contracts and then of course uh yeah so so there there are experts there in in language design and they they do great work and then what they do on the formal side is also that they um write down the semantics of the language so basically what what makes the language? What what are the rules of the language? And and uh, they have one person there, um, James Chapman, who is writing those languages in in a kind of computer understandable and and executable way. So in, in the language called Acta, where he can where then the computer can basically confirm that those semantics are are sound and consistent. And there's a little overlap between um, the two teams because when we do hook in um, uh, Plutus into uh, the ledger, we'll have to talk about you know how how all those details work out. And we've talked with them already and continue to talk to how we actually um, will integrate the scripts into our ledger. 
But I noticed a lot of people in Cardano are using Agda for the smart contracts. However, a lot of people in the base protocol are using something called TLA Plus. So can you talk a bit about how the different tools uh, compare? So there's, I was just talked in the past about Cock. Charles has mentioned Isabel a few times. There's now TLA Plus. There's Agda. Can you talk a bit about what kind of tools you're using and why you're using them? So Cock and Isabel and Agda are all in the same class of tool. Um, they're all um, like Haskell, but with uh, more, they, they can express more things or in fact so expressive that you can do essentially mathematics in them. Um, and this is a uh, very high assurance. It takes uh, a lot of work to work in these languages, but you get high assurance. Um, TLA plus is more of a middle ground where it's like a model checker where you, you describe um, a model to TLA plus. It's not gonna produ produce code for you or anything, but it will tell you where you've made assumptions in the own model that you're generating. Um, and it's designed with time in mind. So it's really good for concurrent systems and um, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so you can write, uh, you can you could write a specification TLA plus and then it can tell you, hey, this is going to deadlock if this situation happens or such and such. Um, so it's a, it's, um, it's a lighter weight tool, but it's still extremely useful. Um, and sort of does a different thing. It's not, um, it's not exactly, uh, yeah, it's a little different. I've got one last question for you. And that is, um, do you have any examples of code that you've had to rewrite as you go through this process? Yeah, I have one sort of fun aha moment when I was writing the spec that, um, I think it might have I might have discovered it when I was actually doing the Haskell executable model, um, which was one of the decisions we made was that we wanted the uh, transaction fees to be explicitly stated in the transaction. There's a number of good reasons why you might want this. Um, it's easy to make a mistake. Um, and if the fee is implicit, you, you could end up providing a much bigger fee than you intended. So uh, one nice check is to explicitly state the fee that you're planning on giving, not just the implicit difference between how much coins are going out and how much we're coming in and just assume that the difference. So we thought it'd be nice to explicitly state that fee. Um, so if you need to explicitly state the transaction fee, one subtlety that came out is in Shelly, we're going to have um, refunds for deposits. So if you want to register a stake key or register a stake pool, you put a deposit on that and you get some amount of it back, depending on uh, how long it's been out. Um, this, here's the subtlety. You don't know when a transaction will be accepted in the blockchain. You just throw it out there and it may be accepted in slot 100. It may be accepted in slot 101. Well, if there's a decay happening on this deposit, how can you predict how much, what your refund is going to be coming back if you don't know um, exactly uh, when it's going to be accepted? So for this reason, you can't exactly make that transaction balance all the way uh, to state your fee explicitly to the exact Lovelace if you don't know how what your refund is going to be. Um, so we were thinking about this. Well, how, how can we explicitly state everything in that transaction without knowing the slot that it's going to be processed? Um, and the solution to that ended up being putting a time to live on the transaction. So you could say this transaction is only valid up until slot 105. And then you can refund that uh, whatever certificate it, it was based on the time to live. So say I will refund you based on as though the transaction was processed at slot 105, um, it's time to live. So there's a bit of a balancing act. It might get processed before then and you don't get that couple of slot difference. It probably makes zero difference. But here we're trying to be explicit to the Lovelace every single time, 100% reliable. So this time to live was perfect because now we can now the transaction knows exactly what its refund will be, exactly what its uh, transaction fee can be, and you have this perfect balancing without even knowing when it's processed. Um, and that subtlety was really hard to see until you're way in the details, and I thought it was fun. Yeah, that sounds cool. I had a. Uh... I had a question. Um, I want to piggyback to something that Sebastian said earlier when he was talking about EOS. And um, when I was doing some research, I, I found out that there are several levels of formal methods or formal verification. There's like level zero, level one, level two. And as something progresses, it becomes more and more expensive. And it, the, the, the process consumes a lot more time as as blockchains are more um, more established. So for example, Ethereum has its issues 
to bring in formal methods at this point in the game, it would be a lot more difficult and a lot more expensive. So in terms of Cardano, how long has the formal methods team been following this Cardano process? Did you guys start at level zero with Cardano or is it something that you've been onboarded later on into this process? Um, a, a little bit of both actually. So um, when we first implemented Cardano, we, we didn't have a formal methods team and it was basically um, the, the traditional method of um, you you have this this goal and you you write the software and um, you do a lot of testing benchmarking and convince yourself that that it's um, that it's good to go to the mainnet basically and um, now with what we're doing for Shelly is that we are doing a rewrite of the of the whole system and for that rewrite we are using formal methods from the start so um, we are sitting together with the researchers, um, basically designing, or we have designed the, the mechanisms for delegation and for incentives. We have, um, yeah, we are writing the formal specs and then programming against those those specs, the, the, the original system. We have also um, uh, considered the existing system and basically um, made sure that we understand it sufficiently well on a, on a formal specification level so that we can make the basically so that we can make the connection to that because uh, we don't want to do something like uh, switching off the chain and then uh, starting it again a month later and or something like that or, or a week later or basically some some time later with with uh, basically just starting a new chain and losing all the history and, and stuff like that but we want to have this this um this transition and so for that we we also did this uh, as you said rather expensive step of um, looking at the software that exists and deriving a specification for it so that we make sure that that we do have the connection but for the the system that that will be deployed during the Shelly process that's basically um, formal methods from the start thank you thank you and I'd like to ask both of you, what's the most challenging topic uh, to use formal methods on within Cardano? So what's what's the thing that is the most difficult? I don't know about most difficult. I mean, one, one thing that that, uh, that we um, basically discovered um, yeah, du during the process while writing those specifications was that we that we had some calculations in there that are not just with with integer numbers, but with with real numbers. So um, there are some in the in the Ouroboros Prowse protocol where you have some exponentiation. You have this decay of the of the refunds. You have something. Um, you know that you, you have some parts in the system where you have non-integer calculations. And um, the standard answer that that you have when you do programming for non-integer stuff is just floating point numbers and. They're efficient and, and everything, but the, the subtle thing is they not always give you the exact same result on different machines. And if you have something like that in the consensus part of the program, then if different machines don't agree on those things, even if just by a little, little bit in, in the last digit, then they will not agree on, on the state of the world and you will get a fork. So that's something that that uh, when we when we yeah w w when we thought about this we realized oh we we have to do something here and we can't just use IEEE um, floating point numbers because we might get a we might get a fork due to that if we have different code bases or just different architectures then that might bite us so um, we had our colleague, colleague Matthias um, work on that and basically look at how can we do these. Um, non-integral calculations um, in a way that we are guaranteed to get the same result on all architectures and you end up with um, a fixed point implementation of those calculations and so we now have two implementations of those two reference implementations in C and Haskell and they they agree on gigabytes of test data and um, also yeah so that's um, that's something that's subtle. I don't know if it's the hardest thing, but that's uh, something where you where you wouldn't think about it if you just uh, write down the specification in, in the first place. It's um, a subtle, subtle thing. I say another one of the uh, more challenging parts is gluing together all the different research. So you know, <laughs> there's papers and there's papers on the incentives. There's papers on. Uh, delegation, there's papers on Prowse, there's you know, a couple of different specifications, and we need to make sure that they all play well together. Um, so sometimes, you know, sometimes they they all have different different uh levers you can pull and you you pull this one and it 
this one pulls out and you gotta you gotta find a balance between all of it and pick parameters that make the whole system work well together. Um, so that can be a challenging piece. So this question is from Mystical Rider. You already answered number one. And uh, the question number one is what kind of work do you do? And we kind of answered that in the beginning of the podcast. Um, number two, how did you join IOHK? And number three, what methods do you use to check that code specifications have been implemented correctly? And at what point are you happy with the testing? So I guess um, two and three, I mean, you gave us a brief introduction of how you got to IHK, but maybe a little bit more detail. And when are you happy with the actual testing? So this was really, um, yeah, it, it was um, nothing, nothing extraordinary. I got an email from a rec recruiter I had worked with formerly telling me about that, that job at IOHK and asking me whether I knew somebody who would be interested in doing something like that. And I said, yes, I do know somebody like that. <laughs> and, and then, uh, yeah, we had a number of interviews and just uh, the standard thing, coding uh, coding exercise. And um, yeah, so, so that's how I ended up here. Uh, maybe, Jared, do you want to say how you ended up here? And yeah, sure. Question three. Yeah, I was sort of, um, I was doing blockchain at my previous job. Um, but I, uh, it's, I think I told you earlier, I sort of discovered this sort of functional programming world and I had made it a goal of mine to become more involved in either functional programming or formal methods. And I saw IOHK listing some Haskell developer positions. And I remember reading that and seeing, thinking like, oh, that is an exciting job. I would love to work there, but my Haskell is not up to speed. I don't think like I'm a senior level Haskell developer. I couldn't get that job. And it was, it was almost like a call to arms for me to sharpen those skills. Cause I'm like, I'm not gonna miss my second opportunity at such a cool job like this. Um, and then I think I, I don't know, remember why, but I checked back on the website and I saw this formal methods listing and I thought, aha, <laughs> like um, this, you know, I think that one is one that I'm suited for. So I, I think I even sent Philip an email saying I was excited. Yeah, yeah you did. Yeah. Um, and then we had an interview and, and a second interview and um, yeah. 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 And so I definitely wanted to be in this, in this space. All right, that's fantastic. It's always good to hear the background of how you got to where you are now. And Philippe, was that did that cover all the questions from Reddit? It's almost like a summary there. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can say a little bit more about number three. Yes, number three. We have. Uh, are you happy with the testing? When are you happy with the testing? Yeah, and so uh, I think Duncan's talked a lot about this before, but I'll you know say it again. So one of the things that we can do is we can generate um, random blockchains and run them through this uh, executable model that we've talked about a bit. So we have this uh, simplified Haskell model, right? That's It's a program. It doesn't have a real network or real database, um, but we can run a random blockchain through this model and see what happens. See if it um, invalidates things we hope to be invalid, that it validates things we hope to be valid, all this sort of stuff. And then we can take that same random blockchain or blockchains that we produced and run them on the real implementation as well and make sure that we get the exact same thing between the models so that they're consistent. Um, so being able to handle the um, same random streams of blockchains, so there might be some interpretation uh, between what you feed to the uh, executable model, and what you feed to the real model, but the, the logic will be the same between them. And that's uh, one thing we can do to guarantee um, that, uh, you know, more evidence along the chain. To, to add on that, so this, this method is called property-based testing, where you basically generate random data, and then you check that certain properties are satisfied by the execution of the program. And you can do that, as Jared said, for comparing two different implementations of the same thing. So the reference implementation, which is basically just a verbatim translation of the, of the, special, of the formal specification. You can also do things like state general properties, like I want the overall amount of money to be conserved or stuff like that. And, um, yeah, and so this this method um, has been pioneered by John Hughes, and we we're lucky enough that IOHK paid uh, John Hughes directly to give us some some teaching in the in the in this in this method, uh, which which was really great because he's very enthusiastic and has a lot of knowledge about how to do this in a very efficient manner. Yeah, and another fun thing is we could even take these random chains and test the Rust client with it as well. Yeah. yeah. So there's all kinds of. Uh, great stuff you can get out of yeah. using the same random data to test all the things. 
Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for that response. We appreciate it. Um, I, I have one final question and then I guess we can wrap up the episode. What do you think, Rick? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So um, there's a meme going around. Well, it's been going around the cryptocurrency when moon and this is, I know your employees of IOHK. So the when moon question is directed to when <laughs> do you think the tech that you're working on will be at the level that you are satisfied? And when will you look back and say, oh, wow, we did all of this. So it's less about price and more <laughs> about what you're building. I mean, there's, there's different uh, things. I mean, the, the next big thing that's coming is the Shelly thing, where we'll have a, a decentralized network and where we, um, I mean, delegation is a, it, it sounds simple, but it's it's actually not. It's a lot of thought that, that has to go into that because you have to make sure that all the information about the delegation is is readily available for the nodes when they want to agree on on the the payouts, the rewards, and you have to make sure that the rewards are paid out in such a manner that they don't clutter the UTXO and the blockchain. And um, so that's there's really a lot of lot of effort going into that. And um, yeah, so that's that's the thing that I that I think uh, we can be proud when it's there. Then of course the the whole um, smart contracts uh, thing. The price going up interests me zero um the price being stable would be amazing um because that would mean people could use it um so when the <laughs> when the price if the price were stable I, it wouldn't it could go down and be stable for me and that would be super exciting for people to be able to use it and trade it and for me the like what would give me great satisfaction and just make me feel really proud of everything we did is to see um you know charles talks about this all the time uh people that don't have access to financial services, if they're able to actually use this in a, in a place where they don't have access to financial services and they're able to this to fill that need for them, that would make me extremely happy and proud. I think that's a great answer. Uh, yeah, um, that, that answers the when moon question. That's for yes. sure. <laughs> so I'm gonna wrap up this episode. Um, I'll, I'll give the floor to both of you at the end. Um, I wanna thank all of the viewers for tuning in to episode 25 of the Cardano Effect podcast. We had Philip and Jared. They're both part of the Formal Methods team. They are working very hard to make sure that the Cardano protocol and the Cardano ecosystem is healthy for years on and it's going to thrive. We are very excited about the new features that you're releasing, whether it be Shelly, everything, there's a backstory behind everything. And I'd like to add that um, there's a formal specification of the Cardano ledger paper written by Jared, Polina, and Matthias. I was looking at it this weekend. Out of all the papers of IOHK, I probably understood this one of the more than other papers. It was, um, I was reading through, um, I was on page 35. I was looking at, they have diagrams on there. They're, they're visualizing the epochs and you know exactly, oh, this epoch ends this and then rewards are gonna be distributed um, like in the next epoch and everything is, Things made sense, which was which was great. So you that might be, that might be wind moon for me right there too. <laughs> That's exciting. So go to the go to the portal and figure it out. Remember, we have papers. We're writing novels here. So make sure you figure this out and go and check the paper out. Everything from there was also a diagram about like when the reserves run out, how the and it was just a visual diagram with arrows pointing to rewards pots and um, the treasury system and how the whole system is interconnecting. So I thought that was really good visualization. I'm a visual learner and I really appreciated all the diagrams and the explanations as well. So with that being said, um, Sebastian and Rick, thanks for co-hosting. We, we, we did, um, this is episode 25. I'm very, this is a milestone and I'm very happy that we are doing this podcast. It's a lot of fun. And Jared and Philip, thank you for joining us. It was an honor. Do you have any final words? Just thanks for inviting us to speak. And um, yeah, it was nice talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much for letting me join. Um, I, I did want to say uh, the the spec, the Cardano legend spec, I do feel like uh, there's a little bit of a upfront cost to learning how to read it, but I think it's something almost everybody could get over. And then it opens up a whole world of being able to understand what we're working on. And I'd love to see questions and comments about the spec. And there are some juicy bits in there that at first look dry, like, you know, just a big table. But actually there's some interesting stuff in there. Once you know how to read it, you can be like, wow, that's, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. So I'd love to see uh, people, you know, uh, bring issues on the GitHub repository. Um, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. 
So thanks, everyone. And until the next episode of The Cardano Effect. Bye.